So, uh, welcome, everybody. I'm uh, delighted to see you here. Um, we're really happy to have this space in front of Ohio University Press for events just like this. Um, this is a particularly um, just uh, a special occasion for us um, because a lot of people don't realize how much collaboration um, sort of goes on in the world of publishing. And um, the first time, uh, Douglas here and I go back a long, long time. Uh, the last time that he was in Athens was in 1997 because we worked, uh, many of you will have heard of James Curry Publishing, a uh, very distinguished and very important uh, African history, um, uh, well, African studies publishing house. And Ohio University Press had a wonderful uh, collaborative relationship, co-publishing relationship with James Curry. And it was in that context that I got to know Douglas. And we worked together for um, many years on creating the East African uh, study series. We worked on a West African study series. And uh, time passed, and uh, uh, they, uh, Douglas and his partner, James Curry, sold um, the uh, James Curry uh, imprint. And at that point, we had started working on a series uh, of short African histories. And it's really become, there are about uh, 25 books in the series, and so I asked Douglas, if he would be prepared to write a short history of South Sudan. So uh, it's not easy to write a very short <laughs> history of uh, even a new country. But he totally rose to the occasion, and I'm very, very proud um, to have him uh, as one of the authors in this series. I think that. Uh, Speaking partially, I think it really is um, probably one of the best histories of uh, South Sudan out there. And it, I'm very, very grateful to the Center for International Studies um, for bringing him here today. And I really want to thank you all for coming um, to hear this interview. Um, we will have snacks and refreshments at some point. Um, and I would also encourage you, copies are available for sale from Little Professor. So um, I'd like to uh, introduce Matthew Lariche, who will tell you more about Douglas. So, welcome. All right. I'm supposed to adjust this thing, and I'm going to screw it up. Nope. All right. There we go. I hope that works all right. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm, I'm really excited to introduce uh, Douglas Johnson. Um, so, I'm, I'm relatively new to the Center for National Studies and to Ohio University, um, but before that, uh, my research and, and work focus for the sort of definitive part of my life has been in, in what's now South Sudan. Um, when I first started, it was Southern Sudan. Um, and of course, um, embarking on uh, engaging in research and looking at the context of that environment, um, the work of, uh, of our guests here um, is uh, amongst the most central, seminal, and important, um, and and if not, uh, a he's a, if not a little bit responsible for me ending up in South Sudan um, by reading um, some of the engaging, fascinating uh, work um, that he's uh, he's produced over the years. Um, certainly, a scholar who has the kind of personal connection to a place that oftentimes most of us aspire to, um, but, uh, but really never, uh, never achieve. So I'm very excited to, to welcome Douglas Johnson. Um, there's, uh, there are few people uh, around who have the, the depth and background about um, South Sudan. Um, Jill mentioned it's a, a new country. Well, writing a history, it, it, it's not really a new country. It's a, it's a pretty long history. The culture and, 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 and community of the place um, has a history that um, goes back, um, uh, you know, longer than, than, than written record. Uh, so to try and embark on a short history uh, of a new country and try to explain the process that has led to the creation of a new country um, of which some of which Douglas has been involved in, which is also pretty important. Uh, so um, 
Uh, I'm looking forward to, to hearing uh, his thoughts, particularly on um, some of the recent uh, developments, because of course, as a new country, there's, there's a lot still going on, a lot of contestation still, in, still going on. We've got the most recent iteration of, of peace agreements in South Sudan. Um, I, I'd also like to introduce Colin Lasu, who's, who's a, a doctoral student here, um, who's, who's from South Sudan, who's been a journalist in South Sudan for a number of years. So I, I'm, I'm particularly excited also to, to see him interview um, someone uh, who, who certainly figures so largely um, in, the in the writing of the history and anthropology of, of South Sudan. So thank you very much, and uh, hope you enjoy the, the event. Thank you. Are our mics on? Yes, we are on. You. Okay, fine. Uh, thank you very much, Jill and Matthew. I want to say one thing first. Uh, publishers don't get a lot of credit from authors. Um, this is uh, un uh, <coughs> unfortunate. And I want to, um, first of all, uh, thank Jill for having been the person who suggested that I write this book. And when I'd agreed to write this book, <coughs> I determined to be a perfect author, not like all the authors that I had dealt with as a publisher. Uh, I was going to send them everything on time. It was going to be the right length, and I would respond to all the proofreaders' and editors' comments. Unfortunately, uh, the first time that uh, I uh, met Jill after having agreed to produce a book at a certain date, I hadn't written a word. And I knew that Jill had heard every author's excuse for why they hadn't written. Uh, she knew too many authors who would talk about writing and never get around to writing. And I just had to admit to her, rather than engage in some sort of face-saving subterfuge, uh, that I hadn't done anything. And then I found how experienced and how sensitive an editor Jill was to slowly, very carefully, gently get me back into the writing mode with uh, perfectly sensible suggestions and a uh, sympathetic approach uh, rather than uh, going home, as she probably did, and kicking the cat and saying, another bloody author who is not going to be producing <laughs> on time. However, it was because of her first suggesting the, uh, the project and then uh, nursing it through very gently that uh, something uh, eventually came out. And I was glad that she was proposing to, for me to contribute to a series of short histories. Because I'm not used to writing a short book. Uh, and if I, and I had wanted to write a general history of South Sudan, and if I were to do it in my normal way, I would still be doing the research and possibly not getting a manuscript completed uh, by the time I had completed all the rest of the years that God might grant me. So um, that is why there is such a book. Now, South Sudan is problematic in a couple of ways. Well, probably in hundreds of ways, but uh, there isn't much in academic history published about South Sudan. There is a great deal about the history of foreign administrations of South Sudan, whether in the 19th century or in the 20th century. There is a great deal about the political upheavals of Sudan, of which South Sudan has been the uh, most prominent part. And South Sudan has been problematic since just a few months before Sudan became independent in August 1955, with the mutiny prior to independence, um, a civil war, um, a brief peace, uh, period of peace after the end of that first civil war, a new civil war, um, an independence referendum, and yet another civil war, this time one entirely internal to South Sudan. So it's very difficult for um, historians or even political scientists to try to put together uh, a, a continuous narrative that can explain uh, these uh, constant eruptions uh, of South, uh, where South Sudan becomes a problem, becomes 
a problem for a new nation like Sudan, becomes a problem for its neighbors like Uganda and Kenya and Ethiopia uh, that receive refugees, becomes a problem for the international community, becomes a problem for international oil companies, uh, just becomes a problem. Um, and one of the things that I felt was important is that South Sudan has been written off in some ways. Historians have decided it is remote and isolated and uh, isolated from the rest of Africa. And therefore, we don't really have to look at the internal history of the country. Now, remoteness is a matter of your perspective. Uh, there is um, supposed to have been a famous headline in the weather report of the London Times in the 19th century, which read something like this. Heavy fog in the channel, Europe isolated for several hours. This is a matter of perspective. Uh, if you say that a place is remote and isolated, that means you don't really have to bother with it. To write a history of South Sudan, then for, therefore, has to do two things or my task, as I saw it, was to do two things. One was to try to begin to write the internal history of at least some of South Sudan's societies, communities. But the other problem, or the other task, was to put South Sudan back as part of regional history of this part of Africa. Because if you decide that the country is remote and isolated, you can't explain the number of languages that are indigenous to South Sudan. Most of the monilo saharan languages, that very large group that encompasses most of Sudan, as well as most of uh, the central Sahelian belt. Uh, if the region was remote and isolated, how did these languages end up being spoken there? There are other languages as well, some even uh, from, from the Niger-Congo area. So <clears throat> the task of writing the internal histories, the indigenous histories of the South Sudanese communities uh, does get combined with writing of placing South Sudan uh, back as part of the history of Africa and part of the history of the region of Northeast Africa and the Nile Basin. Um, <clears throat> I described it as the missing jigsaw puzzle in African history, um, which is um, a little bit overblown, but it's a good image. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that uh, was, one helped me to do that is that Whereas in the early 1960s, when historians began looking at specific episodes in the history of South Sudan in its colonial past, um, uh, not much had been written about African history in general. But by the time that I began writing this book, we had much more, especially in the linguistic history of, say, Chris Errett, uh, or new approaches to the archaeology of the Nile Basin by uh, the archaeologist uh, David Wengro, who has not worked in South Sudan, but has proposed a number of uh, interpretations of the archaeological uh, remains of the Nile Basin. Um, <clears throat> just to mention one problem, um, there one of the topics that I had done quite a bit of research on were religious figures among the Nuer. And the most prominent of the prophets had built a conical, mud conical shrine, um, uh, which uh, the British immediately called a pyramid. It's not pyramid shaped, it's conical. Um, and in my oral history, gathering the oral history about the building of this shrine, um, it was very clear that the building of the shrine began with the sacrifice of an ox, and the shrine was then built up on top of it. And when the royal engineers decided to blow up the shrine in the 1920s and digging a tunnel uh, in, into the base of the shrine to put their explosives, they found the skull of an ox. So the oral history, the oral account, was verified by the royal engineers trying to blow up the shrine. Um, now, what is interesting about that 
is that there are numerous instances of cattle burials in the Nile Valley, in pre-dynastic Egypt, in Kerma, in the Meroitic states of, of what are now Sudan. And rather than think to my, decide that a conical mound might be an imitation, a crude imitation of a pyramid, perhaps one should be looking at what is the significance of cattle burials in the Nile, ba Nile Basin going back millennia. What is the, what is, what are the idioms that might be common to several societies along the Nile Valley, even if they are not connected by time or geography? What is the cultural idiom? What is the cultural archive that the many different societies are, are drawing on at different times? Um, <clears throat> I did have to, of course, bring the, the uh, history up to date. Um, at the time that I was writing my final chapter, there was a peace agreement being cobbled together, so my final chapter in this book is rather more optimistic than I feel now. Uh, strangely enough, I was having to revise another book at that time, um, and by the time I was revising the final chapter of that book, uh, the peace agreement was breaking down, so if you look at the two books, one chapter is optimistic and one is pessimistic, and they both come out in 2016, so you can take your choice. Uh, and I think I better stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, proceeding forward, we would also like to engage your uh, participation in this, and uh, as correctly pointed out, uh, the history of South Sudan, not negating the history of Sudan, is a fairly complicated uh, road trip if you were to take somebody on. Uh, it would take ages and ages trying to understand what really has come out of this very complicated place. Uh, you note um, this glaring uh, view that of whereby the history of South Sudan is negated, we don't we talk about it in sort of in a closed environment, yet it, in this book you bring forth uh, really also a history of a lot of di displacement of the South Sudanese within these particular regions. I, I would wonder, would you spend a few minutes talking about that, uh, the importance of displacement in, in also trying to capture it in this history book? Um, I have one chapter which is about dispersal and displacement. Um, and these are both about movements of population. Um, <clears throat> because there's, there obviously has been movement of population, but on the other hand, it isn't necessarily, um, doesn't necessarily follow that you have huge population movements like the, for instance, the M. Fikani, uh in South Africa in the 19th century. You, you probably did at certain points. Uh, but you have also uh, the movement of certain groups of people and the amalgamation with people who are also in the same region that have come in at different times. For instance, in northern Baja Gazelle, you will, uh, which, is, um, which is predominantly settled by different groups of Dinka, you will see, you will, in Dinka oral history, you will have this account of previous inhabitants of the area who are known as Luel. Uh, we don't know anything about them except that they have not disappeared, they have become Dinka. And um, a very recent thesis uh, about the 19th century expansion of the Nuer moving from the west bank of the Bahal Jebel into the east um, and coming into populations of Anwak on the Sobat or Dinka in the Jongle area, you don't actually have uh, displacement so much of these people as the incorporation so that young men um, uh, who want to marry a newer girl have to be initiated in a newer age set and become newer. Uh, I had this experience uh, in when I was talking to old men in the Jongle area
uh, where neighboring Dinka groups had the same age set names as the neighboring Nua groups and had in fact been initiated in the same age sets as Nua men, which makes it impossible or makes it very difficult for men of that generation to fight each other. Uh, and it's one of the processes, one of the social processes, by the, in the way in which people don't change where they are, they change who they are. Uh, it's not my original phrase. I picked it up from a thesis which I recommend reading. Uh, but it is, a, it is looking at the social process of dispersal. The dispersal can be for environmental reasons. It can be for historical reasons. Um, now, displacement um, of the 19th century happened in a number of ways, but uh, it was mainly as a result of the expansion of the Egyptian empire up the Nile, where you had um, the Egyptian empire of Muhammad Ali and his successors was part of the Ottoman empire, uh, and it was moving into Sudan up the Nile, uh, not necessarily finding the gold and the riches that they uh, thought they were going to find, but it was very much part of a military movement of creating an army of slave soldiers, uh, which is an old process in Muslim countries. And the slave soldiers came from the Nuba Mountains, from the Blue Nile uh, Valley, from the Ethiopian foothills, and from South Sudan. And this became, along with the uh, increase of state slave raiding uh, as a result of the expansion of the Egyptian empire, uh, became one of the major reasons or major uh, ways in which there was a dispersal of South Sudanese peoples um, throughout the region. Now, we don't have much in the way of a study of what South Sudanese ended up in North Africa, in Egypt, and there hasn't even been much of a study of uh, domestic slavery and the legacy of domestic slavery in what is now Sudan. It is for very good reasons uh, because Sudanese historians did not want to tackle the issue of slavery. Um, uh, they felt that the northern Sudanese Muslims had been unfairly treated in the uh, missionary literature and the colonial literature and the, and, very, and the historical literature. So slavery has not been a topic that has been confronted honestly in the academic circles of Sudan. Uh, this makes it somewhat difficult to have a dialogue between uh, historians of South Sudan and historians of Sudan. Um, but that dispersal was in a variety of ways. One, you had slaves taken out and sold or traded uh, or absorbed into uh, northern Sudanese uh, communities. And then you had the army or you had armies and you had slave soldiers who became the backbone of the Egyptian army in Africa, not the Egyptian army in their attempt to move into middle, the Middle East, but the Egyptian empire was based on slave soldiers in Africa. And when the British took over Egypt, the frontier was held by the same soldiers who were not necessarily legally slaves, but they had been captured as slaves and that's how they ended up in the army. And many of them were then used in East Africa. Both the British and the Germans based their conquest on their East African territories on the Sudanese soldiers who had been incorporated into the Egyptian army as slaves or through slavery. That is where you get the so-called newbies in Uganda and in Kenya. They are descendants of Sudanese soldiers who began as slaves and were used by the colonial empire, but colon the European colonial powers, to secure uh, their control of that, that territory. So there is quite a history of South Sudanese being taken out of South Sudan and finding themselves in, in other places. The Mahdist army, for instance, we know, think of that as a religious army. Of course, it was a religious movement. Uh, but 
um, the Mujahideen, the Muslim northern Sudanese who joined the Mahdist revolution, uh, didn't know how to use rifles. Slave soldiers that were captured from the Egyptian army did, and they were the core of the Mahdist army, um, who then defeated the Egyptians and then confronted the British, and even confronted the Italians and confronted the Ethiopians. And um, <clears throat> the famous death of Gordon, uh, which is, uh, we now see it has been uh, commemorated in paintings and film, um, I think did not happen the way that it is believed to happen. Uh, the clearest uh, testimony that I have been able to find that agrees from different sides is that he was shot by a slave soldier. Uh, and that is not a glamorous history. It's not a glamorous death, no. Um, uh, and it also undercuts the image of Gordon as the liberator of slaves. Mm. Let's backtrack a little bit, and uh, for those of you who might have a question or two, just prepare yourself, um, um, in which case I'll give you a chance after this question that I'd ask here. Uh, so we talked about the newbies, and what you've painted is this very expansive view of how these events basically uh, unfolded throughout uh, this very crucial part of the 19th century, when colonialism really is 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 the, the scourge that is, um, has affected the continent of Africa, specifically sub-Saharan sub, sub Africa. And in this trajectory, you talk about the newbies. And uh, earlier, we began this conversation about how the newbies occupy this very contested space within Kenya and Tanzania, where for the reasons of political expedience, if you may, uh, there, had been a there has been a struggle of how to, def to define them as a group because they sort of exist as an ethnic group um, within these two countries, but the governments of the day would rather see them otherwise because when you're thinking about voters and political actions uh, and elections, these may be problematic. Would you speak to that? Well, yes, it's, it's a fascinating um, thing to study. Um, but let me, let me give you, tell you a story. I was working um, during Operation Lifeline Sudan. I, I had a, was working briefly with... And, uh, and this was at the height of the Civil this War? This was during the Second Civil War. It was in the late 90s. It was, no, it was in the mid-90s. And um, there was uh, a Kenyan uh, woman who I was working with who was part of one of these uh, relief agencies. And she explained to me uh, that her grandfather, no, that her grandmother came from Juba. And the explanation was that her grandfather, sometime in the 1920s or 30s, had been in Juba for a long trading expedition and had married, and then brought uh, the, uh, his wife and children back to Nairobi. And Juba would be the current capital of yes. South Sudan. Yes. Right. Um, and she, the, she uh, said, uh, but my grandfather uh, put my grandmother and the children in Kibera. Now, Kibera is now known as the biggest slum in Africa. Uh, maybe, I'm not sure, Lagos mm -hmm. might be, have a, uh, a claim. Uh, but it was settled by the ex-Sudanese soldiers. Uh, they claimed that this area had been given to them by the King's African Rifles as a place to settle in, uh, in lieu of a pension. Uh, so it was known as a settlement of Sudanese who called themselves Sudanese at the time but now call themselves Nubi because once Kenya became independent, to call yourself Sudanese was to call yourself foreign, but to call yourself Nubi was to be able to claim a place in Kenya among the a mosaic of Kenyan peoples. So this Swahili trader brought his Sudanese, South Sudanese wife and his children of that wife and put them in Kibera, 
And my colleague said, she raised her arm and said, you see, my skin's too dark to be called Swahili, so I'm newbie. Um, it's, uh, again, it is not necessarily some, uh, a community that can be called, you know, everybody who is born in it is newbie. It includes people. It keeps on bringing people in. Mm -hmm. It was part of the colonial, the, the, the army was part of the colonial apparatus. Many of the newbie, descendants of newbie soldiers uh, became mechanics, um, butchers, uh, traders in cattle, etc. Uh, they were part of what was becoming the modern economy of Kenya and of Uganda. Uh, so more and more people could become, could become newbie. Yeah. Um, and in fact, there is a phrase in northern Uganda and in southern Sudan about people moving to the town and uh, from, the, from the villages, uh, adopting Muslim dress, the newbie language, and becoming newbie. This is something that people used to say in South Sudan during the first civil war, to come out of the villages and go to Juba uh, as a way of getting out of the firing line of the first civil war was becoming newbie in Juba as well as in places like Bombo or Arua oh. in, in Uganda. So it is a, a, a very mixed community, and many people will trace their descent to a particular soldier from a different particular place. After the fall of Amin, many of Amin's people, or the people who had supported Amin, many of the newbies came back to South Sudan, which they had never been in before, but they would say, uh, well, my great-grandfather came from Rumbek or from Bor or something like that. So there was this movement, um, um, a, a sort of movement back uh, to uh, South Sudan, not as a place that people knew, but they knew that their ancestors had come from there. Hmm. All right. Um, I would like to open this up for any question, uh, clarification anybody uh, might have. I have my series of questions here. Okay. I have a yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could um, just for those of us who are not kind of following the developments in Sudan, uh, he started by uh, saying uh, that you decided to kind of explore the history of South Sudan in a bigger regional context. Uh, I kind of South Sudan in the contemporary context in the Horn of Africa as a state? What is it, what is, how do you see its state? Um. Then um, for the sake of the camera, I will repeat okay. the question. Yes. Uh, basically, the question is asking about how can, you, how, do, how can we discuss South Sudanese history within the context of the Horn or East Africa as a, as, as a region? No, I think his question was how can I discuss it as a state? Hmm. If, if, no, no, I'm, I'm kind of asking you mm. if you uh, would also uh, talk about uh, South Sudan as a state today. Okay, uh, and so those are two different questions. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> in trying to talk about the region as part of a broader region, it is looking at the way in which there are connections between South Sudanese communities and their uh, cultural practices or their internal histories and other peoples, for instance, in Sudan. Uh, the relations, for instance, between the Rizagat and the Four, the Four of Fatit, uh, the relations between the Humer and the, the uh, Nok Dinka, or the, re or the position of the Shuluk Kingdom uh, on the White Nile as uh, an important um, uh, power on the White Nile when you had the Funj Kingdom on one side, Tegeli on another side, and Darfur. Uh, these three sultanates of the 
um, 18th and 19th century or the, even the 17th century are often spoken of as the main powers of that middle belt, that, built, uh, that belt um, between South Sudan and Sudan, whereas the Shuluk Kingdom uh, was in fact a river power uh, at that time. It uh, controlled who could cross the river in trade. It uh, raided uh, as far as Elais. And we know Abba Island, for instance, as the birthplace of the Mahdiya. But as late as the 1860s, it was a Shuluk Island. And the reason why Muhammad Ahmed, who was a carpenter and boat builder, uh, found himself on that island was that the Egyptian government set up boat uh, building boat yards there because it was well forested and they used uh, the building of the boats on, on Abba Island to break the power of the Shiluk oh. Kingdom who controlled the, that uh, part of the White Nile. So that's an, an important aspect of Sudanese history, uh, which apparently has not been written about as part of Sudanese history. So, and looking also in Ethiopia, you have the connections, uh, the, the ANWAC uh, and various other groups who straddle what is now the border, the border which was created in the 20th century. They are part of the history of Ethiopia, of lowland East Ethiopia. Now, your, your, the, your second question is, how do, what do, how do I describe the South Sudanese state? Uh, the South Sudanese state is obviously um, right now in uh, trouble. Uh, it is born out of a civil war uh, where on the one hand, uh, the main guerrilla group, the main rebel group started at least with a public goal uh, which was very different from the goal that ended the Civil War. The public goal, the public pronouncement of the SPLM was to reform the whole Sudan. Now, there is a great debate which I cannot uh, resolve of whether this was one imposed on them by their Ethiopian uh, backers uh, that it was uh, merely a camouflage uh, for the ultimate secessionist tendencies of South Sudanese. Uh, but the effect of that was that it brought the war out of the South. Uh, the civil war was, the SPLA was very largely a Southern army, but by having this new Sudan ideology, they recruited outside of. Uh, South Sudan. They recruited in the Nuba Mountains, they recruited in the Blue Nile, they recruited uh, even in the Eastern Sudan, they recruited Muslims as well as non-Muslims. And it was for that reason that by the time the negotiations for peace in, began in 2002, you had what, was, uh, what the SPLM called, SPLA called War Zone 1, which were the southern provinces, and then you had the other war zones, which were in what is now Sudan, in the Nuba Mountains, uh, quite a lot of the Blue Nile, what is now Blue Nile State, as well as fighting in eastern Sudan um, uh, with some support from groups like the Bija Congress, uh, etc. Uh, John Garang uh, told a story once about how he was reviewing some troops of the Bija uh, who are uh, on, on the Red Sea coast, um, and he said, uh, who are you fighting? And they said, we're fighting the north. And he said to, his comment was, and here we were north of Khartoum, and they were called, saying that they were fighting the north. Um, so th there was a movement, whether, whether, whether the majority of the SPLA truly believed in the new Sudan, I'm convinced from what I heard John Garang say myself that he truly believed in the new Sudan and that in part uh, the intervention of American mediators who still saw the war entirely as between uh, the 
Christian animist South and the Muslim North, Arab North, um, they saw the war in, the, in those terms, even though by 2002, when the U.S. became involved in the mediation, the war had moved out of South Sudan uh, and had quite a, a, a body of recruits that came from what is now Sudan. I would add to this, there was a very unusual aspect to this so whole history of this current, mm. this war that led the role that Muammar Gaddafi played. Yes. And, mm. and as one commentator who happened to be mm. a very young soldier at the time, mm. uh, he recalls saying, here we were fighting the North and who gives us our first weapons? <laughs> An Arab. <laughs> <laughs> next door in, in, in Libya, mm -hmm. and we, which is kind of a fascinating side. I suppose mm -hmm. that might be the other, uh, another aspect uh, to delve into because uh, yeah, you, you talk about it, but you don't delve so much into it, the, the importance of digging into some of these oral histories in order to map this history of this new nation. Well, I think... Um, uh, uh, Research of uh, history or research into the way the Second Civil War began and who was brought into it, uh, and uh, I think that is something uh, that needs to come. And I think a lot of people are beginning to delve into. Uh, Matt himself has written uh, extensively about this. Um, uh, I <laughs> I want to leave something for other people to do research right. on, okay? Um, <clears throat> I, I'm much happier in the 19th century than in the right. 20th or 21st, but um, uh, it is true. I mean, what you had was a moment uh, in the uh, international politics of the region where the South Sudanese could get backing from the Derg in Ethiopia because the Nimeri regime was backing the Eritreans and the anti-Derg forces in Ethiopia, but they could also get support from Gaddafi, who wanted the overthrow of Nimeri. And once Nimeri was overthrown, Gaddafi ceased his support of the SPLM, the SPLA. But he was the one who gave them their only anti aircraft missiles. Mm. Uh, and uh, the, this notion of the new Sudan, which uh, John Garang did a mm. really good job in pitching it, and the mm. idea that all Sudanese would be equal in the eyes of the law and nobody would be treated, mm. if you may, in practice or indeed mm. as a full citizen of this, mm. this country. Uh, to this date, mm. the ongoing wars in Sudan, uh, specifically in the Darfur region, uh, the Blue Nile, uh, this is on the east coast with, with Ethiopia, um, and, and uh, in the corridor funds uh, on, the, on basically just north of the South Sudanese border, mm -hmm. is firmly driven by the concept of the new Sudan. Uh, what, what, uh, what more can you say on this? Well, I, th I think this is important because while international focus uh, has been on the internal conflicts in South Sudan, as a result of an unresolved uh, conflicts during the Civil War. Um, the, the, the interim period, for those, in 2005, there was the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, which was signed, and it was a sort of two-process peace agreement. Uh, it set up a government in South Sudan and in the government of national unity, but it had a six-year interim period which ended in 2011 with the referendum in South Sudan on whether they should continue to be part of Sudan under the conditions of the CPA or independence. Uh, and in that period of the interim period when the government of South Sudan was being established, there was no significant uh, attempt to address the divisions within South Sudan that had been created by the war. Uh, because South Sudanese uh, did fight each other during the war at different times, uh, sometimes as independent groups, very often as independent groups that allied with Khartoum. Uh, 
And that left a legacy of distrust uh, and conflict that was never addressed in that six-year period uh, when the SPLA themselves uh, had to confront the fact that they had been uh, guilty of atrocities against civilians and against specific communities. And that not being addressed before the referendum meant that it, it all came to a head after independence. Now, it is also true that the failure of the new Sudan idea left a legacy in Sudan where those groups that were recruited into the SPLA because they believed in the new Sudan idea, that it wasn't just a southern movement going for southern separation, uh, who felt abandoned uh, by uh, the independence referendum in South Sudan um, uh, breaking off from Sudan. But also, there was some residual support within South Sudan for these groups that continued to fight in the Nuba Mountains, in the Blue Nile. Darfur was never really part of the New Sudan project. Uh, uh, the SPLA never really made any headway in Darfur, uh, never really attempted that. But Darfur is a running sore in Sudan, just as the Nuba Mountains are. Blue Nile, which is close to the Ethiopian border, is a much more difficult uh, area for an ongoing guerrilla ca campaign, but there is still fighting there. And there are potential uh, fissures uh, continuing in eastern Sudan. Again, the SPLA never really made any headway there. They allied with uh, armed groups that were part of the National Democratic Alliance that was created after uh, the NIF coup that brought in uh, Bashir and Turabi. Um, uh, so to a certain extent, uh, the failure of the New Sudan project was a failure of the SPLM to really promote it. Um, uh, but there is still fighting in Sudan, and we really mustn't forget that. Um, I remember uh, a conference on, on Sudan, a Sudan Studies conference in Pretoria a few years ago. Uh, a Sudanese got up and said, once the South becomes independent, we have had a war in the far South, but the war will continue in the near South, uh, which is exactly what has happened. Uh, it may not be as big a war as was the war the S of the SPLA, but it is in that transitional belt between the far north and South Sudan where most of these conflicts are taking place. Hmm. I'd like to open it up to another question. Yes, please. asking about your opinion on the peace agreement. Which, which peace agreement? The several? The, the most recent. The most, the recent. most recent. Okay. Um, I'm skeptical, as I think most people are, because uh, it has focused very largely on the distribution of government positions. Um, uh, I th what is the number of vice presidents? Is it four? I believe or, four. Or they floated five. 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 There are going then to be five have. vice presidents, mm. uh, which is accommodating the different current opposition four. groups. Mm. Mm. Um, and, and there are other opposition groups that kind of want to have their own vice president, too. I think there is... There, uh, my feeling is that because the main mediators were... EGAD, the EGAD countries, the international, what are EGAD, the intergovernmental um, EGAD, Association for Development, again, again, which again. includes Sudan, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, uh, what's left of Somalia, uh, Kenya, mm -hmm. Uganda. That was the body that hosted and negotiated the end to the civil war in 2005. And my, my criticism is that whereas you could 
bring that war to a uh, halt with this idea of creating a temporary power sharing government that had the uh, National Islamic Front, some of the opposition parties, as well as the SPLA, SPLM, in government in Khartoum, uh, as well as creating uh, a separate government in South Sudan. Uh, the war in South Sudan cannot be solved by the same approach of trying to have a power sharing between a government and an armed opposition. For one thing, there is no united armed opposition, uh, as the SPLA was. Uh, and for another thing, the basic problem that uh, many South Sudanese are still talking about is not who is going to govern, but how are South Sudanese going to govern themselves. And this is where the question of uh, federalism has arisen. What is going to be, how, how is power going to be structured in an independent southern Sudan? Is it going to um, mimic uh, how power was structured in Sudan with power concentrated in the capital city with whoever is able to control uh, the government? Or is there going to be a different sort of distribution of power, both political and economic power, throughout the country? And this is where the, the term of federalism has become very popular, uh, but there is at this point no clear de definition of the type of federalism uh, people are really hoping to have. Um, we can go in that a little bit later uh, if you want, but uh, I think that this is the fundamental uh, problem of the current um, peace agreement. Uh, for one thing, it leaves the power of national intelligence and security uh, untouched. And this is a, a group of uh, many of them, though Southern Sudanese were in uh, national intelligence and security uh, under the Khartoum government and ha are continuing the methods of that uh, uh, that they uh, operated under. Um, when they were part of the government of Sudan. Uh, and they are a body where it's difficult to know when a journalist disappears and his body finds out, it turns up on the Nimali Road. Was that ordered by somebody in the government or was that the national intelligence uh, security people operating independently? Uh, and there are, what, 25,000 of them? I mean, it's uh, nobody has exact numbers. Nobody has an exact number. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're and, not prepared and, and to tell they, you. They, uh, you know, what is? They have the power to arrest. Yep. Uh, national intelligence has the power to arrest. Um, so th this is is this uh, what is really keeping the current government or the current group uh, in the government in power, or is this a shadow government in itself? Uh, this has not been touched. Uh, by the the uh, peace agreement. Mm. Other questions? Uh, uh, would you say that uh, South Sudan's current challenges is more internal or, or like uh, you could say that there's, a, there's a fact that maybe neighboring countries such as Uganda and Kenya are playing, especially mm. in relation to the uh, long-term achievement of peace. Would you say that they, they, they are contributing positively or uh, how, how would you term that? So the, the question is, would you, would you say that uh, the neighboring countries to South Sudan, as you mentioned, Uganda, Kenya, um, and Sudan, would these be contributing positively or negatively to the future of this nascent state? Okay. Uh, I think the fundamental problem is internal, and, and I think South Sudanese uh, would prefer to be able to blame the neighboring states, especially Khartoum and especially Uganda, uh, for meddling in their affairs. And to a certain extent, there has been meddling. I mean, uh, the Ugandan army intervened uh, in 2013 when the fighting was approaching uh, Juba. Uh, Khartoum has given support uh, 
to a variety of opposition groups, some armed, some uh, not. Um, but uh, people can't be uh, forced to rebel or take up arms uh, by an external force if there isn't something to rebel against. Now, South Sudan is a landlocked country. It has to have good relations with its neighbors. Um, uh, its uh, relations are, um, and the neighbors themselves uh, have to have good relations with it because when there is conflict in South Sudan, it spills over into the other countries. So there are more refugee camps now in Ethiopia as there used to be during the, first, the, the previous civil war. Uh, there are people who have moved into Kenya and in, well, you, you have a lot of uh, government ministers investing uh, their wealth in uh, Nairobi, for instance, or in Kampala. Um, and of course, there, there are now refugees, uh, Sudan, South Sudanese refugees in Sudan, just as there are Sudanese refugees in South Sudan. Um, so the, the, the way in which this problem, the internal instability of South Sudan can be solved will, of course, uh, need some, some, I won't say intervention, but uh, must also involve uh, those countries that are neighbors who are directly affected by it. Um, I think both Kenya and Uganda have benefited economically by their ties with South Sudan because they are the ones through whom goods uh, uh, move to get to South Sudan, or they are the ones who are producing the food that is imported into South Sudan. Um, uh, and I think that those countries particularly uh, have more of a motivation to see peace in South Sudan rather than to uh, become involved, directly involved uh, on a long-term basis in the internal fighting. I might be wrong about all of them, but um, uh, long-term, I think it's to their advantage that there isn't internal strife in South Sudan. So the, the United States, through the new ambassador, whom, as you mentioned earlier, um, has decided that as far as this peace deal, this current peace deal that was signed, I believe just last month or something, mm -hmm. they are taking a wait and see approach, if I'm not wrong, uh, in, in the words of the mm -hmm. ambassador. Um, you had the chance to brief the ambassador. Are you at liberty to share uh, uh, what, the, what and how that uh, went? Uh, <laughs> Uh, it was very low key. I wasn't really asked any um, serious, well, I won't say that I wasn't asked serious questions, but I, nobody felt that I had answers that they would uh, naturally want to follow. Um, I'm used to, I mean, academics uh, have, uh, you know, are, are good resource persons, but nobody thinks that an academic has the solution to the world's problems. Mm. Uh, certainly, uh, nobody has treated me as having that. Um, the, the United States, uh, and I think, I mean, the U.S., the U.K., and Norway were the three main countries that were behind the CPA. They were the ones that really pushed it and, in many ways, financed it. Um, and they also were involved in uh, creating the international environment for um, supporting the interim period, the creation of the government of South Sudan, the support for the um, uh, government of national unity. Um, and, and they've kind of got tired of putting money in peace agreements that don't work. Um, because one of the things that has happened, of course, when there was the peace agreement that broke down in 2016, before it broke down, you had the opposition um, uh, politicians brought back to Juba, uh, made ministers, put up in hotels, and the foreign governments were expected to pay for the hotel bills of the ministers uh, in the new government. Um, this is something that is um, not going to happen again. 
uh, under the current, especially when you now have uh, five uh, vice presidents that all have to have um, uh, armed compounds and several, I don't know how many ministers they're going to be, uh, as well as 500 uh, members of the National Assembly. Uh, the foreign governments, having seen that this didn't work before, they're not going to put their money oh. into supporting that kind of salary bill oh. of a new government. Oh. A final parting question? Yes, sir. question is what role the media would play in this struggle. Well, that is very interesting because there, there has been an attempt by South Sudanese journalists to create a liberal media environment from the very beginning, uh, which hasn't, uh, which has failed so far. Uh, so that uh, newspapers that have been produced locally uh, have been seized by security um, their editors arrested, uh, journalists that have been um, prodded too much into government corruption have been found dead on the Nimili Road. Um, there has been extreme uh, intimidation uh, of the media. However, I think that because we are in a very different environment about the media these days, you have a number of websites that are reporting constantly, and they're accessible in South Sudan in many places. Um, because one of the things that happened during the interim period is that telephone masts went, uh, went up all over Sudan, South Sudan and Sudan. Uh, so it is possible to get internet connections in many parts of, of South Sudan. Uh, in, in some surprising places. So you have things like Sudan Tribune, which is run by Sudanese out of uh, Paris. You have uh, various South Sudanese uh, websites. You have the Gurton Trust, uh, uh, which is managed by um, uh, Jacob Akol in, in the UK, but they have an office in Juba. So there is a circulation of, of news and information uh, some of it unregulated, some of it completely false and, and bonkers. Um, some of it uh, promoting, uh, you have people in Australia or in Fargo, North Dakota, uh, getting onto the internet and urging people to kill uh, you know, the uh, one group or another. Uh, while they are, you know, sitting safely in as part of the diaspora and exile, um, so uh, I don't know to what extent the internet has been responsible for a inflaming tensions in South Sudan, oh. because I'm not sure that there are uh, clear um, research on on that. And nor am I uh, quite clear on uh, to what extent the media has been possible, has been promoting and generating support for peace agreements. Let me give you an example of something in the old days. There used to be a radio station in Ethiopia called Radio Voice of the Gospel, uh, which was run by a Christian group. I forget what church it was, but it was there in Addis Ababa. And uh, people in South Sudan listen to the radio frequently, uh, transistor radios. They listen to BBC, they listen to Radio uh, Deutsche Welle, they listen to Radio South Africa, they listen to uh, Radio uh, Voice of America, uh, they listen to Congolese stations in French. When uh, the Addis Ababa Agreement was signed in Addis Ababa, this was the agreement that ended the first civil war in 1972. Joseph Logu, who was the head of the South Sudan Liberation uh, Front at that time, went to the uh, studio of Radio Voice of the Gospel and said, could you announce the peace agreement, that we reach this peace agreement because more people in South Sudan will hear that if it's announced by you. And so it was put out on Radio Voice of the Gospel. 
Uh, that was in the days mm -hmm. when people were listening to, to, to radio. Um, and the voices were, that they were hearing were fewer, and also the journalists that were reporting uh, were also um, trying to report things that they could confirm, which is, of course, uh, something that you can't rely on on all of these different websites that have now grown up, uh, where they might be reporting something that is true. They might be reporting because they're able to talk to somebody on their cell phone in South Sudan, even if they are uh, in Sydney, Australia, uh, and get some news and put it on a, a website. Um, but um, as I said, I, there's no, been no real um, systematic research on the impact of these right. external websites on uh, the conflict or the peace agreements in South Sudan. Well, in parting, uh, thanks for being an attentive uh, audience. But uh, on your question of the, the media, uh, that uh, until I left uh, Juba, we had been ardently campaigning for the passage of the three crucial uh, media bills at the time. Um, but the, one of the key components of, uh, of, of those media, what, there are now media laws signed into, 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 uh, into the laws of the land is that it still criminalizes uh, uh, libel. So it takes a government official to make an accusation, accusation that uh, he's been defamed, and uh, the police will show up and carry you away, which some mm. of my, our compatriots have found out the, the hard mm. way. Um, and if you look at it, actually, that's one of the major deterring factors uh, that have prevented a lot of local journalists, for example, to make contributions on some of these issues out there. Uh, but uh, there are some very brave people who are still working on these matters on the, on the ground. Yeah. So I thank you all. Uh, I believe we have copies of the, of the books uh, over here. And uh, uh, Douglas here will sign some your own copy. And, um, and you can have one and read it for yourself. It's a fascinating little book. Uh, a pocket book, if you a ask me, book, yeah, yes. and uh, worth your while. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. I, I, I think.